Hey guys, Adam here, talking a little bit about prescribed fire and timber management. But before we get started, please click the subscribe button so you can follow along on this channel as we continue to add videos on habitat and hunting. If you listen to the weekly podcast, you hear us talk a lot about prescribed fire and timber management. And on this site, uh, we're doing a restoration of a woodland and in some parts of this unit this is about 90 to 100 acre unit we're doing a savanna restoration so basically we came in with a timber unit or a timber sale cut some of the trees and then we've been doing ongoing forest stand improvement and thinning out the forest because this site tells us it needs to be more open it needs to be more of a woodland or a savanna so we got the chainsaws out and the drip torches and over the course of a couple of years we've been putting some habitat on the ground if you look over my shoulder, you'll see scattered post oaks and uh, just a lot of green vegetation on the forest floor. Before we started this, about three years ago, it was pretty much closed canopy forest with a little bit of green vegetation on the understory. Why we most excited about this is because this is the kind of work that's good for all animals and it's good for the ecosystem, it's good for the land. We're restoring, a, uh, we're restoring something that's limited and pretty much neglected across the Ozarks. And through some chainsaw work and a prescribed fire, we're making the wildlife and the land happy. If you listen close, there's a buzz and there's a lot of singing going on with insects and birds. But for all you deer hunters, why should you care about this? If you look behind me, we're here in the middle of May right now, and there is two to three, in some places, four foot tall vegetation growing. This has been growing and photosynthesizing and providing tons of forage long before any crop fields have been planted around here. This was greening up in March. Soybeans don't typically go in the ground, if they ever go in the ground around here, until late April or in May. So this is providing forage long before crops have been planted and in many cases food plots have been planted. What's that mean? That means there's forage available when antlers begin to start growing or does are starting to prepare for fawns to hit the ground. So if you're wanting to maximize your land, you need to look at your historical site index, know what was there pre-settlement and try to restore that. In this case, it's a woodland. It may be a savanna where you're at, it may be a glade, um, or it just might be a, a savanna. There's a lot of different ecosystems out there, but if you can look to restore those, you're gonna benefit your wildlife, not just deer, but the whole ecosystem. There's a lot of birds singing. Um, and there's a lot of diversity. If you listen to the podcast, if you follow our page at all, you know diversity is king. And when you look out across this, there's so much diversity. We've got native shrubs, we've got stump sprouts from some of the previously cut timber, uh, and then we have scattered trees. We've got a chinkapin here, post oaks. Um, there's just a lot of different trees. Another chinkapin right here. There's even a walnut right there. But if you look down here, we've got um, wild bergamot, we've got one of the spider warts. We actually have a, uh, I believe it's the four leaf milkweed that's just getting ready to bloom, aromatic sumac, uh, a gray dogwood, and all kinds of probably woodland sunflower. Um, there's a, a wide variety of species here, which mean a wide variety of food if we're going to talk specifically white-tailed deer throughout the year. We've got herbaceous plants that are gonna begin turning green and greening up in March, provide forage all summer long. As you transition into uh, fall, we're gonna have a mass crop and more mass crop because we have healthier trees, healthier oaks. And then at the same time, we're gonna transition into woody browse during the winter months with all this young woody growth here. Um, and at the same time, it's year round cover, not just for fawns or um, later on in the year for deer because as the season progresses, this will grow up and be really, really great cover. Um, and so many great things about this. Personally, one of my favorites is seeing the summer tanagers zipping around through here. Um, there's just so many great things that can happen here. But most importantly, biggest lesson to learn, we had burned this place a couple of times over the course of the years before any timber, and timber management was done and really not a whole lot of reaction or um, growth coming up on the forest because of so much shade with the trees above. Night and day difference now that we've cut 
and we've done even more thinning. Plenty of sunlight reaching the forest floor, plenty of energy from the sun reaching the forest floor, and that energy is now in the form of plants, which can be transferred into deer um, and, and other critters. So super excited about this, and just one of the many, many things that we've got going on here at the Prairie Hollow property to make our habitat or our landscape more beneficial to all wildlife. So with all this sunlight reaching the forest floor and all these stems that were, were cut, big question we get is how do you keep it from growing up in brush? How do you keep all those stump sprouts not from just shooting back up and instead of cutting one stem, you have eight stems to replace it? If you see here, this is the young hickory that is stump sprouting, because here's the log. And uh, one of the big ways, the most important way that we're continuing to manage this area is with prescribed fire. This will grow up. We burned this last spring. We're gonna run it with another fire next year and it will knock these stump sprouts back and they'll be back down to within a foot from the forest floor, still providing great forage um, and not getting out of reach and to where we can't control it with prescribed fire. Another great thing about this area, as I step over here and try to wade my way through, How do you keep the prescribed fire from killing trees? If you look at this post oak, it's got a little bit of a, a char, well, from the prescribed fire. But trees like post oaks and chicken pen oak um, and a couple of other, our other oaks have adapted.